Good evening. Welcome to Five Country Close-Up. I'm Rick Taylor. And I'm Deborah Cutter. In less than three months, Americans will elect the man who will serve as the President of the United States for the next four years. And the activities this summer are proving to be a foretaste of the heated campaign this fall. Well, the conventions have given us an insight into the platforms on which the candidates will run and on the personalities that each of the campaigns will take on. Tonight, we want to give you an overview of the two major conventions this summer and a look at the issues involved in this campaign. We'll have a look at the most significant third-party candidate to run for the presidency since Teddy Roosevelt and his bull moose party in the early part of the century. But first, a look at the Republican National Convention in Detroit covered by Rick Taylor. From the beginning, it was an unusual combination, conservatives meeting in a liberal Democratic town, a strong union town at that. Republicans in Detroit in the week of July the 13th through the 17th. The mayor of the town said that he welcomed the Republicans, and there were signs which read, Detroit loves a good party. Well, did that mean the Republicans themselves or the bash that they were going to have in Motortown? Then you must consider the fact that residents of Detroit would have welcomed just about anyone to give them national coverage on television. Well, Detroit proved to be a gracious hostess. The delegates, the media, the candidates loved the city and the hospitality. That was a surprise because most had heard that Detroit was nothing like it really is. But an even bigger surprise awaited the delegates inside the convention hall. Iowa, a place to grow, cast it 37 votes for a former Iowan whose spectacular and sensational career has grown and grown since he was a sportscaster in Iowa. We're very proud to cast all 37 of our votes for the next president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. Iowa, 37 votes for Ronald Reagan. It was expected to be a boring convention. What was going to happen? Ronald Reagan had the nomination sewn up even before the convention began. The only possible You're variable singing. which might cause any interest You're at all was strong. the selection of vice president. There were rumors that George Bush, Howard Baker, or Phil Crane would get the nod from Ronald Reagan. Well, the but then there were rumors that it might be Jack Kemp of New York. He was young, time. handsome, and he might balance the ticket time. for those concerned about Reagan's age. Paul Laxalt of Nevada. Well, just too close to Reagan country to be of any real benefit and probably some detriment. Then came along former President Jerry Ford as the rumored first choice by Reagan as his running mate. Jerry Ford? Hadn't he been in the White House before? And in fact, didn't some people feel that Ronald Reagan lost in 1976? Because Ford and Reagan just couldn't get together. What on earth would now the two be running on this rumored dream team? Well, the idea of the dream team was enough to send representatives from each delegation to the Reagan headquarters to find out. The delegates on the floor became excited which excited the members of the media. Then it happened. Everyone knew it would be a Ronald Reagan, Jerry Ford ticket. No doubt about it, network correspondents were saying, it's 99% sure that Ronald Reagan and Jerry Ford will run together in 1980. The dream was overwhelming. The delegates could feel it. They felt excitement. They felt they were invincible. Then quickly, like a thief in the night, the dream vanished. Not Ford, but Bush. Bush, not Ford. But what I will be doing. Bush. Great. What a choice. George Bush. It should have been Bush all along. Why did we even think about Ford? Many of the delegates were saying. So the Ronald Reagan, Jerry Ford ticket was marked through. A detail. And the Ronald Reagan, George Bush ticket was written in. But the Republicans were still united. This is a unity convention. Uh, I think all Republicans uh, are behind Ronald Reagan, and that's the central theme of the convention. I'm not hearing much discord at all. The delegates left Detroit with a feeling that they had shaken the nation with their convention. They had put together a ticket that would effectively challenge the Carter-Washington establishment. I think we've gotten together. I think the game plan will be to present the record of Jimmy Carter and to hit that record. And I feel that the Republican Party is going to be able to bring before the American people all the failures of the promises which Jimmy Carter has made and has failed to keep. 
But what about the activities behind the scenes, the delegates themselves? They had paid thousands of dollars to even be in Detroit to witness and participate in that week's activities. Did they get their money's worth? Did they feel they were successful? Did they have a good time? had a lovely time. Marvelous, exciting. It was once in a lifetime experience. In addition to the gaiety of the affair, Republicans put together a formidable team. The Democrats would be the first to tell you so, and they did right after the Republican convention. I sent him uh, an official telegram of congratulations. I think the ticket uh, that they've chosen uh, will be uh, formidable, but I'm uh, confident. The Republicans, on the other hand, feel less fearful about the Democratic ticket of the incumbent president and vice president. The fear that is in the minds of the Republicans is that the Democrats will attack them on the issue of Ronald Reagan the man, the candidate, and not on economics, foreign affairs, and domestic tension, which are areas where Jimmy Carter shows weaknesses. But to the issue, the time remaining between now and November. The polls show Ronald Reagan has a 15, 20, or 25 point lead over incumbent Jimmy Carter. But that was before the Democratic convention. What about a month down the road? Can the Democrats close that gap? The Democrats say they can close the gap between them and the Republicans, but the Republicans say that it will take a miracle to do so. But miracles have happened in far less time than the two and a half months between now and the general election in November. Well, it certainly looks as though the Democrats are going to be waging an all-out effort to attack Ronald Reagan, the man, and that is what the Republicans fear the most. On the other side of the political battlefield are the Democrats and their less-than-complete show of unity in New York. The country was shocked to see an incumbent president have such a serious challenge from a senator for the nomination of his party. But the Democratic convention in New York was the scene of much anticipation and interest. The 1980 Democratic convention. It would be a convention not like any other the Democrats have had and certainly not like a Republican convention in Detroit one month earlier. The Republicans had gone into their convention almost totally unified behind one candidate, Ronald Reagan. But the Democrats were split. The split was between President Jimmy Carter and Senator Edward Kennedy. And the battle between these two prominent candidates would take place in New York City. Start spreading the news. I'm leaving today. delegates and alternates packed their bags to head for the Big Apple. Before their week was over, this convention hall at Madison Square Garden would be jammed with over 25,000 delegates, press, and onlookers from 50 states. Those delegates came here to work hard, play hard, and meet New York's people. New York, I think, is what the Democratic Party is all about, and that's people. Well, we like it because the people have been very friendly, courteous, and helpful. It was to this hall where the delegates flocked, and in this hall where the first crucial vote would take place in the 1980 Democratic Convention. Delegates would be asked to decide in a roll call vote whether Rule 11A could be interpreted to allow delegates to disenfranchise the people they represented in the primaries and vote for a new candidate. The week before, 17 Iowa Kennedy delegates had said they would vote yes on that rule change, and a News 5 poll showed at least seven other Carter delegates would join in that vote. It was a vote many said would be the most crucial of the whole convention, and a vote that would help set the stage of American politics for the next four years. See it is, is being very dangerous in the context of this convention. The president's taken a very strong position on the issue. If he were to lose that, that vote, I can imagine literally chaos in this convention. And but when the votes were in, it was Carter all the way. Billy Gate had scarred the president, but not enough to ruin him in 1980. Iowa delegates had voted 29 for a closed convention and 21 for an open convention. Ed Campbell, the Democratic chairman for Iowa, was happy with the results. Well, I was pleased with the vote. I think the people now have the opportunity they were waiting for, and that is to cast their ballot for the so-called open rule or binding convention uh, ballot. So I'm pleased that it's over with. But not everyone was happy with that tally, and Iowa's Kennedy delegates insisted it would take more than a vote to unify the Democratic Party. 
At this point, I, I don't think we can ever support Jimmy Carter. Do you think that the Democrats can win in November if they can't pull themselves together? Very possibly not. That night, Kennedy delegates were even more shocked and saddened when the senator announced he would not submit his name for nomination. But Kennedy said he would continue his fight on economic issues, and it became quickly clear his delegates would stand behind him. In the next 24 hours, Kennedy forces would win compromises on three major issues. But a fourth issue, a $12 billion job package would be won by Carter. The Democrats would pass the Equal Rights Amendment and they would take a stance on the controversial abortion issue. The discussion of the Democratic platform tended to dominate the convention scene for most of Tuesday. That is, until a demonstration for and a speech by Senator Ted Kennedy that night. I have come here tonight not to argue as a candidate, but to affirm a cause. I'm asking you to renew our commitment to a fair and lasting prosperity that can put America back to work. Tuesday night's speech by Kennedy would be noted as a foot in the door for him in 1984, but it was also a warning to Carter forces they might not get the backing of Kennedy on the podium Thursday night. The backing Carter so desperately needed to unify his party and beat Ronald Reagan and the Republicans in November. There are some very real differences, some very real uh, hurt and anger. It's starting to heal, and I think it will heal a significant amount, but I, it, that's hard to know. I, if they cannot unite, can they win in November and beat the Republicans? That's a good question. <laughs> the controversy on the convention floor did not keep the more than 5,000 delegates from having a good time in the Big Apple. For three days, they had also been exploring New York's restaurants, shops, and people, and the city had welcomed them with open arms. Uh, we're not business. We're not doing no business. Are you still trying to be nice to him, though, to show him the city? Yeah, whoever comes here. Business is definitely being helped. It could be helped more, but it's being helped. By Wednesday night, everyone knew it was Carter for the Democrats in 1980, but only the roll call vote would make it official. The final tally was 21-29 for Carter and 11-46 for Kennedy. Iowa delegates had voted 31 for Carter and 17 for Kennedy. The convention floor rose to its feet in a show of support. The vote was merely a formality, but it was a signal to Democrats that in 1980, Jimmy would be their man. If we start with reality and fight to make our dreams a reality, then Americans will have a good life a life of meaning and purpose in a nation that's strong and secure. At the close of that Thursday night acceptance speech, Senator Ted Kennedy did join Carter on the podium, but his support was less than overwhelming. It didn't matter, though, because now Jimmy Carter was the Democrats' best shot at the White House in 1980 and for a second term. The balloons in Madison Square Garden fell by the hundreds while delegates cheered him on. That was the final scene of the 1980 Democratic Convention, and only time would tell if the party had made the right decision. The Iowa delegates packed their bags and started the trek homeward. They had aching feet, aching backs, but most of all, memories they would never forget. We went to a play, and we went to um, see the Empire State Building and just walking around to different bars and things. Rosemary, uh, did you like your trip to New York? Fantastic. It was yeah. a beautiful experience, unforgettable, a historic event. It's up to you. Deborah Cutter outside Madison Square Garden at the Democratic Convention in New York. Among the issues which the Republicans will attack in the Carter administration are inflation, foreign affairs, and domestic unrest, all of which have shown that Carter has some weaknesses. And in addition to those matters, there is always the difference between the Democratic platform, which is in favor of a number of social programs, and the Republican platform, which has surprised a number of people by being against those programs. But now, with the political conventions behind us, the Democrats and the Republicans have published their positions on key issues of the campaign. Chris, Chris Abel has a report on three of the most important controversial issues affecting residents of Iowa. In our relations with it takes at least four years to develop direction for a political party. This year's conventions that molded those directions were no exception. The issues changed, but the rhetoric stayed the same. Iowa, the first caucus state, in the Union, and also 
the one state this year who's going to ratify the ERA and the rest of this Democratic Party. Of the dozens of issues affecting you and I in Iowa, tonight we will concentrate on three. The ERA, the economy, and elderly care. The ERA is strong in the hearts of many Iowans. Nationally, the Democrats endorsed it, the Republicans didn't. It was a controversial move for the GOP, but will it affect the Iowa vote? The Republicans should have endorsed it. Are you going to vote Democratic as a result? I think I'd lean that way, definitely. So, so I'm voting Republican regardless. Regardless. Uh, right. Uh, Having ERA would uh, just make it a whole lot simpler rather than having to have every state legislate every little thing separately. It appears through recent polls that most of Iowa's women want the ERA, but that other issues could overshadow it when voting in November. So when it comes to the sagging economy, females could make the difference. They boast the biggest voting bloc in the state. More than 80,000 Iowans now are out of work, the most in 40 years. The Democrats have endorsed a $12 billion jobs program with promises not to raise interest rates if that puts people out of work. The Republicans take a different route, calling for massive tax breaks to spur business. Because much of the state's 150,000 organized laborers are attempting to work in Des Moines, this area will tremendously influence the Iowa vote. With jobs the number one priority, the Democrats seem to have the upper hand. And again, we're saying we don't think an overall tax cut's what's necessary. We need to, we need to stimulate it particular areas of the economy, but when you analyze those tax cuts that the Republicans are calling for, a majority of the benefit is going to go to people who have incomes over $30,000 a year and to big business. Though Carter admits the Democrats' job program could cost too much and that Congress may not pass it, unemployed Iowans want it. As far as the unemployment rate the way it is, it, you know, they got to have more job openings, you know, more uh, schooling and whatever, you know. Well, they're going to have to create more jobs. That's all there's to it. Well, the Republicans are doing won't do that? I don't believe so. I think they're going to have to pour that, create all those jobs and pour that 12, what is a billion, into the economy. Plus, laborers demand protection from inflation. We're talking about four main areas. We're talking about uh, food. We're talking about health care. We're talking about housing. Uh, we're talking about interest rates, and if you take a look at those areas, that's what's causing the inflation. And so we're, we're at, we advocate a controls program in those areas. Still, the traditional Democrat ways of stimulating the economy through federal programs and federal money failed to set well with many farmers. They helped Iowa vote against Carter in 76, and with farm income down sharply, Carter's grain embargo hurts them. The, the markets have been so erratic, and the, the embargo is a, a very, very large factor in this, in, in my opinion. The, the early months in the, in the marketing year, January through April, May, I think it was quite a factor, actually. And this was the time of the year when farmers were facing extremely high expenses of fertilizer, uh, seed, fuel, and all, all their inputs for growing their crops. Vince Hassebrock farms 500 acres near Ames. He wants less government controls. Allow free enterprise to work, he says, a basic premise of the Republican platform. I think it's rather a hoax that tends to get pulled on uh, not only farmers, but uh, people in general when they think that government is going to solve their problems. Both farmers and laborers boast large voting powers. The turn of events until the fall election will tell which group deeply affects the election's outcome. This brings us to the state's 100,000 senior citizens and their need for care. Inflation and recent utility rate increases have cramped their fixed budgets. Both Democrats and Republicans are calling for increased aid for elderly, though the GOP will do that through tax breaks, while the Democrats favor specific federal programs. The senior citizens fear their Social Security may soon run out if more people aren't put back to work to fund the program. And they're talking about, you know, taking money out of the Medicare end of it and put into the Social Security to support it. But what bothers a lot of us is, how long can this continue with the unemployment the way it is and it don't look like it's going to be cleared up for a long time? It's how long the two of them can stand and sustain uh, our senior citizens on Social Security. But I've always said, and I've said this back for the last six, seven years, he should have put on control, whoever was president at that time, should have put on control 
for at least six months and try to level this thing out and work it out with labor or business and the whole bit to stop. But he keeps it on a voluntary basis. And I never seen anything voluntarily work yet. So you have a few of the issues. The political platforms are now made. But as in the past, with the election still months away, those platforms will probably fall into the background as the candidates' accomplishments rise to the top. We may shout over ideals now, but in the end, practicality sometimes rules. I'm Chris Abel for Five Country Close-Up. In addition to Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, independent candidate John Anderson wants to live in the White House for the next four years. More on him when we come back. Could he be someone special? I think she's kinda neat. Maybe he likes me. Maybe she likes me. Wonder if we'll meet. It's so hard, but when the hard part's through, that's when we go for something easy. Like a and W. choice for carpet? Lee's, of course. All across America, the people's choice for carpet is Lee's. And right now, Lee's is having a people's choice sale on their best-selling carpets. Choose from plushes, sculptures, or twists, including carpets of DuPont and Tron fibers that resist dirt, wear, crushing, even static shock. Lee's carpets are the people's choice in their own sale right now. Your Lee's dealer in Fort Dodge is Carpet World. And in Nevada is Linda Glant. Peterson's spectacular August home sale is now in progress. Save 20 to 50% on answers for all your window worries. First quality Crosal antique satin ready-made draperies are one-third off. Coordinating shears for the over-under look are 20% off. Save 50% on Permel made-to-measure draperies with over 100 samples to choose from. Whatever your taste or window problem, we can solve it at Peterson's with the August home sale now in progress. The issues of the campaign will influence some people on how they will vote, but a good majority of the people will never look at the platform, but will vote on either personalities or from frustration of not knowing who will best serve the country. And still another portion of the voting public will opt for the third party candidate. This year, Congressman John Anderson has presented the most impressive showing of a third party candidate of anyone since the Great Depression. Joanne Merrigan has a report on the Anderson campaign and its significance. John Anderson for president. It's a slogan that may open a new door in politics because despite the odds, this independent candidate really aims to win. In early June, Anderson's Iowa headquarters opened. The goals of these campaigners may seem far-fetched to those familiar with the political process, but Meredith Myers, manager for the state headquarters, couldn't be more enthusiastic, yet she is realistic. She knows this campaign faces some very tough problems. When you don't have a party behind you, um, you have to find everybody uh, who will support you uh, from scratch or from the beginning. But we have no party files to go back to. Uh, to say these are Republicans or these are Democrats and so they're going to be for our man. Uh, we have to find our people. The Anderson campaign has already established county chairpersons in over 60 of the 99 counties in Iowa. And Myers is anxious to point out that more people at least seem interested in Anderson. People are stopping by to get an Anderson bumper sticker or to sign a petition to show their support for the candidate. Myers points to their petition drive to put Anderson on the Iowa ballot as a very hopeful sign. She says they needed only a thousand signatures, but they obtained more than 20,000. Who is an Anderson supporter? Well, Meredith Myers exemplifies one kind of supporter, a Democrat who became disillusioned with the party. I think that we need a system that is flexible enough to respond to the public's needs. And I don't believe we have that kind of system. And I am proud to work for someone who is the caliber of man that I believe Anderson is, who has come forward to give us that option. And Tobin Wirt represents another kind of supporter, a registered independent who is leery of politicians in general and the two-party system. For some reason, he is not leery of John Anderson. I don't see him really being affiliated with, with either party. I guess what attracted me to him is kind of the combination of, of both parties, you know, and not feeling like he's obligated to any certain party platform or line, you know, going with his 
his own conscience. And who is this man who represents a modern-day savior in this political world of disenchantment? Republican John Anderson has been a congressman for some 20 years. He first came to the attention of Iowans and the rest of the country during the Republican debates last January in Des Moines. Anderson showed himself as an issues man, not soft-spoken about the problems that face this country, the economy, the energy crisis, defense spending. When Anderson did poorly in the primaries, he finally made the decision to become an independent candidate. Some said that decision would hurt the party. Anderson said the people deserved an alternative. I do not accept the prediction that this is going to fragment and divide the country. If I thought for one minute that I were simply a divisive voice in this country, rather than offering an honest alternative to the American people, I would not be on this platform before you today. His campaign workers say Anderson is a man who's not afraid to say what needs to be said. And while his Iowa organization seems to be coming right along, the one question does remain. Can an independent candidate really take his dreams and visions all the way to the White House? Anderson for president, may I help you? His Iowa supporters insist Anderson can make it to Washington. These two men, Luther Hill and Ben Gibson, both helping to run the state campaign, represent a third kind of Anderson supporter, the moderate Republican, who some say doesn't have much of a national voice left in the Republican Party. Of course, the biggest problem to Anderson's campaign is money. The major party candidates will each receive $29 million from the government, but as an independent, Anderson won't get a dime. It seems to me that a candidate who is now in the polls receiving beyond 20 percent of the vote, a fifth of the voters say they're going to vote for him, uh, more than that in certain states, that candidate should receive uh, some kind of public support if elections are in fact going to be paid for by the federal government. Hill says despite the drawbacks, this campaign will be run like any other. They'll seek contributions, and they're counting on continued disenchantment to spur those contributions along. Anderson forces are counting on something else, the fact that Iowa has more registered independent voters than Republicans or Democrats. They say if just a few Democrats and Republicans would join Anderson, he could win in Iowa and take the eight electoral votes. It's a good theory, at least on paper. But supporters insist Anderson's appeal is spreading. In the weeks ahead, there will be daily meetings and the organization of a strong media campaign. This is a test of grassroots politics in the truest sense. The people who type the letters and lick the stamps are all here for a purpose. By mid-September, Anderson says his name will be on the ballot in 50 states to represent the alternative he offers. His supporters, of course, are convinced he is the best man. They say all that's left is to convince people he does have a chance to win. Joanne Merrigan for Five Country Close-Up. We have been impressed this summer by the dedication of the delegates to the two conventions and how seriously they took their jobs. It would be a shame for a small percentage of the people to decide who will lead us in the next four years in the White House. So we urge you to vote and to actively support the candidate of your choice. Thank you for watching tonight. I'm Deborah Cutter. And I'm Rick Taylor. Have a good night. We'll see you tonight at 10 o'clock on the late edition of News 5. Good evening. Welcome to Five Country Close-Up. I'm Rick Taylor. And I'm Deborah Cutter. In less than three months, Americans will elect the man who will serve as the President of the United States for the next four years. And the activities this summer are proving to be a foretaste of the heated campaign this fall. Well, the conventions have given us an insight into the platforms on which the candidates will run and on the personalities that each of the campaigns will take on. Tonight, we want to give you an overview of the two major conventions this summer and a look at the issues involved in this campaign. We'll have a look at the most significant third-party candidate to run for the presidency since Teddy Roosevelt and his bull moose party in the early part of this century. But first, a look at the Republican National Convention in Detroit covered by Rick Taylor. From the beginning, it was an unusual combination. Conservatives meeting in a liberal Democratic town. A strong union town at that. Republicans in Detroit in the week of July the 13th through the 17th. The mayor of the town said that he welcomed the Republicans, and there were signs which read, Detroit loves a good party. Well, did that mean the Republicans themselves or the bash that they were going to have in Motortown? 
then you must consider the fact that residents of Detroit would have welcomed just about anyone to give them national coverage on television. Well, Detroit proved to be a gracious hostess. The delegates, the media, the candidates loved the city and the hospitality. That was a surprise because most had heard that Detroit was nothing like it really is. But an even bigger surprise awaited the delegates inside the convention hall. Chairman, I want to you're on 5 TV. And this is News 5. Good evening from News 5. I'm Deborah Cutter. And I'm Rick Taylor. Two area men are in critical condition tonight, and a third is in serious condition following the crash of a light plane near Truro this morning. Officials say the plane took off from a landing strip five miles west of Truro around 10 o'clock, but something went wrong and the plane went down. The pilot, 21-year-old Dennis Jones of Des Moines, 49-year-old Charles Frederick, the president of Seed and Grain Systems, and a systems employee, 54-year-old George, John George, excuse me, of St. John's, were all injured. The men were rushed to Iowa Methodist by the flight helicopter, and an investigator for the FAA says there's no clue.